I think we've got everyone in. So on behalf of CanCOVID, I want to say bienvenue and welcome to everyone who's attending today. Uh, you'll notice that uh, Dr. Samir Mubreka, who is going to be decoding COVID for us today, uh, is not on screen in order to preserve the audio quality. She's going to be off the screen until her presentation is over. At the end, we'll have time for a few questions, which you're welcome to go ahead and put in the chat chat box. You can even put them in during, uh, when you think of them during the talk, if you like, I'll, I'll scroll through from the top. Um, these sessions, they happen on Tuesdays and Fridays from 4 p.m. to 4.30 every week. Um, make sure that you're signed up for our CanCOVID uh, email list and we'll be announcing the speakers or you can follow us on Twitter. Um, we've gotten a lot of attention recently. Um, Navdeep Baines gave us a shout out uh, uh, um, with his recent CSPC talk. And in fact, we um, are having a CSPC panel ourselves uh, on June 10th and you can register for that. Go to our Twitter feed or go to the CanCOVID Slack for more information. Now, without further ado, and not trying to take up any more time from Dr. Mubreka, uh, I would like to present Dr. Samir Mubreka. Thank you so much, and take the take the floor. Thank you very much, Kim. Uh, bonjour tout le monde, bon après-midi. Uh, mon nom est Samir Mubreka. Je suis infectiologue à l'hôpital Sunny Brook. I'm one of the infectious diseases docs at uh, Sunny Brook Hospital. I'm also a medical microbiologist and a virologist. And it's a real pleasure to be with you this afternoon, late on a Friday. Um, I have here my email address if anyone wants to reach out to me. I'm also on and off the Ken COVID Slack channel. So by all means, if you want to connect, you can also message me there. So what I hope to do today, I, I was debating whether to focus 30 minutes on a single aspect or we get in depth on a particular topic versus trying to do something a little bit broader. And I opted for the latter. The reason being is that you know, there are a lot of things that we've talked about, particularly in the context of the response to this pandemic. But I think that we need a little bit of perspective around viral ecology and biology in particular, because really only if we have some fundamental understanding around some of these key features uh, of the virus, um, it's going to be difficult to know what we don't know and where to go to next. I hope there'll be a few moments of levity. It is, like I said, after all, Friday afternoon, if anyone wants to take a few minutes to go grab a cold one from the fridge while I natter on in the first few slides about random things, by all means, if it makes this a little less painful for you. So I'm going to start with a really broad question. Where do viruses live? Um, and the answer really, in a way, is quite simple. Absolutely everywhere. We know that there are virums in ocean waters. We know that they're in the ground and pretty much within any single living being on the, on the planet. And um, this rabbit in particular is not necessarily a random rabbit, it's a snowshoe hare. And the reason I put it up here is because one of the first books for me in viral zoonoses was when I was working um, as a medical resident uh, in Winnipeg at the, at the National Microbiology Lab. I had a, the opportunity to briefly rotate through Mike Debit's lab where he was working on snowshoe hare virus. And that's when the study really dropped about how things are so interrelated and how a virus from this cute little rabbit um, can actually cause encephalitis in humans. And really that, those interspecies spillover events, and the ecology around it and the biology behind it um, is how I got hooked on, on studying viruses. So people are starting to understand this context a lot more so than in the past. Um, what we know now is there are certain orders of mammals, and we'll just focus on mammals here to keep things simple. Obviously, avian species harbor viruses as well. Um, but rodents in particular are an incredibly diverse uh, group of mammals, and that's reflected in the viral species richness that they harbor. Similarly for bats, I think everyone appreciates now that bats can serve as important viral reservoirs for a number of zoonotic viruses. Um, and in addition, there are other major orders, so carnivores, lagomorphs, which are rabbits, audiodactyla, which are things like moose and deer, primates, like monkeys, etc. The more diverse a species is, the more zoonotic viruses they represent. So these are how things have co-evolved over time, but that's not the only determinant. Looking at species abundance is really key as well. So not surprisingly, humans are the most abundant species on the planet. 
and we obviously have many zoonotic viruses, bearing in mind that viral zoonoses aren't necessarily animal to human, they're just interspecies. And then followed closely by our domestic animals, particularly those that represent commodities for us. So cattle, swine, um, goats and sheep. So they're also in high abundance and not surprisingly, they also harbor a significant number of zoonotic viruses. And that makes sense because we think about how much we interact with these animals and then the opportunities for the viruses to actually adapt and spill over are there. So the other thing that we can actually look at in this context is how they are interrelated. This is that are harbored by these um, domestic, which are denoted here in, in sort of a teal color. And you can see them over here that these are sheep, goats, etc. cetera. Um, really harbor an incredible richness of, of zoonotic viruses and they are all interconnected in, in these gray nodes here. These are the actual zoonotic viruses. And then there's a certain, well, significant amount of interconnectedness with all these other species, these wildlife species that are um, uh, interconnected with domestic animals and peri-domestic animals, peri-domestic animals like vaccines, uh, but also with each other. So plenty of opportunity for adaptation and spillover. I didn't want to get rid of it. Sorry, it'll drive everybody crazy if I leave it there, but I'm not sure that it was actually me. It must have been me, but hopefully everyone can live with it. I'm not sure how I managed to do that, but I don't want to delay. So maybe I'll just, it'll just be. National Union or um, the Conservation of Nature Red List, so that's essentially the endangered species list. We can look at viral richness and specifically zoonotic viral richness in that context. And um, that's exactly what these authors did. Really, animals that were of the least concern had a significant amount of zoonotic viruses, but of all threatened species, the ones that were threatened due to human activities, like exploitation and habitat loss, had twice as many zoonotic viruses. And so Essentially, that's not surprising because of the high degree of interaction uh, leading to the uh, threatened status of those animals. So that leads us to trying to understand, and again, as I mentioned at, off the top, we're really looking at this from a big picture perspective, at least uh, at this time. And we will definitely zone into uh, the virus and its genome uh, in, a, in a moment. But if we look at, again at a framework of how we went from a pre-emergent state to an emergent state. It has to do with the interactions between wildlife species and domestic species, possibly humans. Again, the problem is not wildlife. It's not that nature is particularly a threat, uh, quite the opposite. It really is our encroachment and our interaction, how, how, it, how it rolls out that, that is the issue. And this area, the pre-emergent uh, area, is really probably the most understudied. When we get to localize the emergence, that starts to pique people's interest, a little bit of funding, um, certainly things like Ebola virus and Nipah virus, people will be very familiar with those examples. Again, underscoring the expansion of human and wildlife, um, uh, expanding that interface being one of the key features relating to localized emergence. And then from there, um, humans uh, have become essentially the most effective vector of all, um, in terms of ensuring that there's pandemic emergence once human to human transmission occurs. And there are ways to look at this, uh, particularly at the human animal interface in terms of how encroachment happens and how at the edges of encroachment. So the more of an edge there is, the higher the contact there is between humans and animals. And so this is essentially what this denotes humans and brown um, animals, but particularly wildlife in green. And with a wider, broader edge, there's more interaction and more opportunity for viral spillover. So we're going to focus a little bit more now on the coronavirus in terms of its
and uh, somewhat entertaining in terms of really highlighting what the role of bats could be. Um, they are indeed amazing animals. They're the only mammals capable of continuous flight. So these bats, many of them migrate, uh, also a pretty significant proportion of them, at least in Canada, hibernate. Um, they're important in terms of ecosystems, specifically in terms of um, pest control and also pollination. Uh, and really, as I mentioned uh, earlier, they're incredibly diverse. 20% uh, of um, mammals on Earth are bats. So we don't know exactly how uh, SARS coronavirus spilled over from bats to humans. It is possible that some intermediate host, pangolin theory at one point was posited. It tends to go up and down in terms of popularity. Raccoon dogs have also been mentioned. Um, we don't know if there even was an intermediate host, um, certainly possible. But there are a number of reasons that um, bats have really been, um, I guess, targeted in a way. Uh, and a lot of it, it does relate to the fact that some of the really high consequence, high profile pathogens that we've encountered in recent years, again, things like SARS coronavirus 1, Ebola virus, uh, most likely originated in bats. So the question is, why bats? What is it about bats that has allowed this to, to happen? So I've already mentioned that bats migrate and hibernate, and those probably contribute to different degrees um, to the propagation or distribution of, of viruses, obviously migration by, uh, by movement. Hibernation, whether that allows for certain viruses to become latent um, or not, certainly been a theory that's been posited. And then there are bat behaviors. So they, they tend to be very gregarious and they can roost together in pretty large numbers and very, in very compact, poorly ventilated spaces. So that's another reason that viruses may potentially spread quite readily among them. Um, and then there are times where uh, maternal roosts become established and then there's synchronized parturition. So pups are born at the same time of year, generally speaking. And that introduces another, so these birth pulses introduce new uh, susceptibles within the population. So that might be another way that viruses are able to be maintained throughout um, intergenerationally in, in bats. There are also some great papers and some really fascinating um, discoveries around the bat immune system. So like humans, bats also have an NLRP3 inflammasome. Um, so in humans, we know that this inflammasome is quite important in terms of protection from things like influenza virus and, and um, staph aureus. But with bats, the immune response tends to be less inflammatory and more tolerant. Um, so as a result, bats rarely get sick. Uh, obviously, there's some viruses that can make bats sick, like virus. Some of these other viruses don't make them sick, but they're, a lot, they're able to persist in these animals. Um, so you can see from this uh, on the left here that Coronaviruses are quite a diverse uh, group of viruses. I'll show you that in a second. But they are also uh, able to infect quite a wide range of different bats. We've heard mostly about horseshoe bat um, and then the Egyptian tomb bat with, with respect to, to MERS. But there are many other species of bats that can be infected by a, a wide range of different coronaviruses. So we can think a little bit about uh, how pandemics actually happen. And three conditions have to be met. Um, the virus, humans have to be susceptible to the virus. There has to be sustained human to human transmission. And the virus has to be virulent in humans. So if you think of something like um, highly pathogenic avian influenza virus, for example, it meets two of these criteria. It's incredibly virulent. Humans are susceptible, but knock on wood, we have not seen sustained human-to-human -human transmission. And the reason some of these um, components are very important is that it allows us to develop uh, tools to look at risk assessments. And even though these are generally developed for influenza, for example, TIPRA, which, which the WHO uses, we can really apply the same principles to uh, other viruses like coronaviruses. And you can see some of the components and risk elements that are taken into consideration here. And it really highlights how important it is to have foundational, fundamental knowledge about uh, viral biology. Um, things that are usually quite obvious, 
knowing what the receptor is and what the bind receptor binding properties are, what the distribution of the receptor are, is. Um, also understanding population immunity, whether or not the uh, virus can actually transmit in mammalian models. So for example, for influenza virus, that's one of the things that any novel emerging virus is, um, is uh, evaluated through uh, transmission models using ferrets, for example, to determine whether or not it, can, it, it transmits among mammals. Um, looking at genomic characteristics, obviously uh, epidemiological determinants are incredibly important, as are clinical determinants such as disease severity and susceptibility to antivirals. So let's talk about the virus itself, the SARS coronavirus. So you can see here that it's an enveloped virus. It has a number of glycoproteins on its surface, and I think everybody has heard quite a bit about the spike glycoprotein. Um, the reason it's so important is because it has uh, the receptor binding domain, which determines how it binds to host cell receptors. And for SARS coronavirus, we know that that's uh, ACE2. The other important thing about the spike glycoprotein is that it also harbors antigenic sites, clearly very important. And then the other um, very important point is that it also has a fusion protein, and that allows the virus to enter the cell. So as I mentioned before, coronaviruses are incredibly diverse, and I've already talked about how that diversity is reflected by the number of different hosts that they can inhabit. And I've already talked about bats, but it's not only bats and humans that coronaviruses can infect. Anything from murine species um, to cattle. So OC43, a very common coronavirus cold virus that probably most of us have been infected by, uh, originated in cattle. And then there are the gamma and the delta coronaviruses that are predominantly avian in origin. And if you look to the right here, this is a, you can tell that this is an older figure because, and, and uh, I do this out of nostalgia for January and February when we're still calling it NCoV. Um, this is one of the first figures that was published uh, showing the viral genome. And it really was incredibly helpful because by placing it uh, in a clade, it was possible to uh, make some assumptions even before, um, knowing a lot about the virus, for example, that it was separate from uh, the Merbeco viruses. So it was less related to MERS, more related to SARS coronavirus 1. So these were really, really very helpful um, indicators. And the other thing is also trying to relate it back to uh, the origin. So looking at how these viruses of human origin um, appeared to be quite closely related to that coronavirus. So back to the actual uh, virus and coronavirus replication. And the reason I'm highlighting this is because really understanding how this virus evolved to spill over um, is seated in the biology of the virus itself. So beginning with viral entry, and please don't worry, I'm not gonna take you through this whole, the whole life cycle. I'm just gonna highlight a couple of really key points. Um, knowing the virus receptor, I've already said ACE2 for SARS coronavirus 2, it's different, it's DPP4, dipeptidyl peptidase 4 for MERS. So already that's an important notion because if we start thinking about potential for reassortment, particularly if you're in the Middle East and you know that these viruses are co-circulating, a cell would have to express both DPP4 and ACE2 for both MERS and SARS to co-infect the cell to potentially lead to, to uh, recombination. Once inside the cell, the virus is still not able to do much until it's actually re released into the cytoplasm. And that's where the spike glycoprotein is really important. So the spike glycoprotein, as I said before, harbors the fusion peptide as the endosome acidifies. There are conformational changes that allow that fusion protein to be exposed and to insert itself into the endosomal membrane. By doing that, it creates a pore and then it allows the viral RNA to enter the cell. So the next most important thing is really how the coronavirus transcribes. And the reason I highlight this is because it's really key to understanding viral diversity. We know that coronaviruses are very unique in their ability to um, generate subgenomic RNAs. And these subgenomic RNAs and the whole idea of discontinuous extension is how the coronavirus has sort of gained um, the name of their order. So the needle virale, so the nested uh, viruses. And without going into too much um, agonizing detail, essentially what happens to this discontinuous um, transcription is that the five prime end, which is located at the beginning of each of these uh, structural proteins, um, 
actually annealed to the five prime end of the virus itself. So instead of as a monopartite genome transcribing the entire genome for for and then being um, cleaved uh, in cis and in trans, like we see with a lot of other uh, monopartite uh, viruses. Um, instead, it's a little bit more efficient in some ways. It only transcribes uh, or creates such genomic RNA for, for the genes for which proteins are ultimately translated um, in relative abundance. But this means of, of uh, transcription, this, this whole idea is an opportunity for two different viruses that are in the same cell to actually recombine. So that's one of the ways that coronavirus is actually gain in diversity. The other would be the single nucleotide polymorphisms that's pretty common across a number of different uh, RNA viruses. This is really relevant um, in terms of adding diversity. And I'm just showing you, if anyone's interested in this, this is a, it's slightly older, but it's a pretty good review of this, this concept. Um, and I just selected a couple of the viruses. They go into great detail um, about many more in this review. But if you look at things like MERS coronavirus, for example, one of the lineages, lineage five, is a result of recombination between lineage four and lineage three. Uh, similarly, an OC43 genotype D is a combination of other OC43 genotypes. And that, that's not that surprising that you, know, you might potentially have co-infection with more than one particular genotype and that both might actually recombine. But if you look at SARS here, this is SARS coronavirus one, uh, that landed in Canada some time ago, uh, back in 2003, you see that SARS coronavirus uh, 1 potentially uh, recombined, possibly with 229E, that's another seasonal coronavirus, or even IBV, which is um, an infectious bronchitis virus, which is an avian coronavirus. So I guess one of the things we need to bear in mind when we're looking at whole genomes is would whatever method we're using, are we able to see recombination? Um, if that's a limitation of our methods, then I think it's important that we try to address that going forward. Um, I think in the interest of time, I'm going to, well, no, I'll just go through this slide very quickly because again, it uh, gives you a sense of how SARS coronavirus might have potentially recombined uh, to gain enough fitness to spill over into humans. So again, here's the virus that landed in Toronto. This one is from Guangdong, and this one is actually from a civic cat. And you can see these ones here that are SARS-R or related are all from bats. So with the, well, this was now post-emergence, but if one were to do this pre-emergence, maybe this would have been picked up somewhat earlier, possibly. Um, you can see that there are a number of different adaptations uh, among the bat coronaviruses that did ultimately end up, uh, they're denoted in purple here, in human um, coronaviruses. So how does one make a pandemic? How does one start a pandemic? Well, first, uh, if you're a virus looking to start a pandemic, find a human, and that's not very difficult given, again, I've all, I, I know I was on a bit of a soapbox about encroachment, but that really is probably the most important predisposing condition in terms of uh, initiating spillover. There will be, because of the range and richness of these viruses in, in reservoirs like that, there will be random changes that might allow uh, for adaptation. But if there's no uh, proximity to humans or domestic animals and then spill over to humans, there's no opportunity to select for those changes. However, if we make conditions such that it's easy to spill over, that's indeed what will happen. So Finding a human now is not that difficult if you're a virus, given our relative abundance. The next thing the virus has to do is really make the right moves in terms of binding and entering the host cells. So we know a lot of these animal coronaviruses uh, don't enter human cells because the receptors are just not competent. But something happened with this particular virus. So, um, and again, another nice uh, paper for those who are interested, this is a, a good one to look at. You can see here that there are some bat SARS coronavirus related um, sequences that were there before. So this is in the spike protein specifically in the receptor binding domain for, for ACE2 that pre-existed and were probably selected for when there was opportunity to spill over into humans. The other really important change, and at first people thought this probably happened post spillover. Now I think there's a little bit of data that suggests that it might have pre-existed in bats 
is a polybasic cleavage site. So this fusion protein that's really crucial for viral entry uh, in SARS coronavirus 2 has a polybasic cleavage site which allows it to be cleaved by ubiquitous uh, proteases like furin. Now this is something that is not lab generated. It's definitely been described in a number of different um, viruses found in nature, including influenza virus um, in, in avian species. And that's what makes an avian influenza virus highly pathogenic is this polybasic cleavage site. So here it is, it's not surprising that an adaptation like this uh, would be acquired and enable um, possibly transmission, but almost certainly virulence in humans. So that's the next thing. The virus has to transmit human to human. So um, I think now with genomic epidemiology, which has been a fantastic tool to really understand where viruses are coming from, we're gaining quite a bit. So this is from a group in New York. I don't usually uh, show preprint data, but uh, Viviana Simon and her group are quite um, well known. So they're fairly comfortable doing that. And it looks like New York was able to determine that at least a fairly strong proportion of the viruses that, that spilled over were from this clade A1A. Now we know that started in Europe. I don't think the resolution is much better than that at this stage. But again, that underscores the importance of adding more and more genomes as much as possible so that maybe we can achieve some of the resolution that would be helpful for, for tracking and tracing. We do know that the A2 uh, most likely originated from, from the UK. So again, these are, are um, really important contributions if, if um, if we're able to get enough genomes in to, to make some inferences about transmission, particularly as borders open up. Um, and also the fantastic thing here is that this data is so important in terms of being able to look at geotemporal uh, patterns of spread as well. And I'll only very briefly uh, mention next strain. I'm sure many of you are familiar with it. And there are many, many more genomes here now. I just have this particular screenshot because this was the first Canadian case. Um, so this is a case from Sunnybrook Hospital that um, we sent the virus on to the National Micro Lab and then over to Vito. So Vito, um, well, the Public Health Ontario sequenced it, but uh, Vito was able to isolate it and, and uh, sequence it as well. So the last thing is really that what the virus has to do is cause disease in terms of pandemics. And so our group has been busy working in the CL3 and we isolated um, uh, SARS coronavirus some early March. Um, you can see this is from, from that work, so uh, cytopathic effect here is pretty obvious and when um, supernatant was passed it was reproduced. Um, we also showed that the virus is uh, quite able to bud out of uh, structural cells, so particularly Kelly cells or, or human lung cells. Um, we also looked at a number of different um, immune cells uh, which we found were, did not result in productive infection, but if you actually look inside the cell, so this CD4 cell in particular, the virus is there. And other people have shown that as well. So if you test the supernatant, there's no viable virus, but there's definitely evidence of intracellular viral replication because these cells were infected at an MOI of 0.01. So there really shouldn't be that much virus inside the CD4 cell. So I know that there's no time to really talk about immunomodulation uh, here, but I'm hoping at some point during this series, uh, someone who's working on that will have the opportunity because that's a very important area of research. So this virus has teeth. Um, I think I've already highlighted a lot of what I was going to say here, and I realize I only have uh, one minute uh, left, so I do want to get to what I think is next. Um, I do want to really underscore the importance of foundational knowledge and understanding viral biology and ecology. If we don't understand pathogenesis and host virus interactions, um, it's going to be very difficult to get to um, you know, the end, end goal of developing medical countermeasures. Obviously, these things are not mutually exclusive and they happen in parallel, but it's absolutely critical that we continue to develop our foundational knowledge. Applied genomics, we need to have a near-term focus on um, we need to know when the recombinants happen that could have significant impact. Um, we need to understand the genomic epidemiology and, and people like DNA Stack and the Vector Institute are developing these great tools to really enable and translate that. Um, we need to phenotype the genotypes we identified. A lot of these changes will be inconsequential, but we do not miss the one, want to miss the ones that will impart 
tightened virulence or immuneness. So we really need to be able to phenotype these viruses. Um, so given how tight, in fact, over time I am, um, <clears throat> I'm just going to underscore the need to really think about the longer term or the long road uh, and uh, really investing in capacity and resilience, uh, having centers of excellence for when this happens again. To be honest, I don't think this is going to be done anytime soon, so we need to invest in them now to just even see us through this pandemic. And I, I, I um, still would like to under, underscore the importance of interspecies studies because if we don't know where we're going with this, we will get into trouble. We've already seen this virus spill over into muscolids or mink and then spill back into humans and into cats on the same uh, mink farm. So there will be more of that if we don't, uh, if we're not more aggressive around this, this human animal interface. Okay, I will stop now and I unfortunately have left no time for, for, uh, for questions unless people want to stay back. Thank you so much, Dr. Samir Mubreka. You've given us so much uh, food for thought and things to chew on. If anyone does have questions for Dr. Mubreka, she said you can contact her on the CanCOVID Slack. Um, you can also, if you wanted a copy of the slide deck, reach out to me, Kimberly.Colburn at CanCOVID.ca. Uh, and if you wanted to review the talk, the it will be posted on YouTube shortly. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Mubreka, for joining us, and thank you to everyone. We'll see you next week. Thanks, everybody.